Hello, I want to welcome everyone once again to today's um, series. Today we'll be discussing cardiovascular system examination. And what we'll be talking about, you know, how to check the pulse, you know, check for other signs of, you know, of cardiovascular examination, the jugular venous pulsation, the, the, the precordium, and how to auscultate, and how to pick the findings on auscultation. So I would like you to sit back and enjoy um, this video. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Thank you. So the first thing to do is to you know, clean your hands again and uh, seek consent from the patient to proceed. Tell the patient what you'll be doing. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So I'm Dr. Igu. I've been asked to examine your heart and also I'll be checking your pulse as well and your neck. That's fine. You can go ahead. Can I? Okay, proceed. Thank you so much. Do you have any discomfort, anything, anywhere? No. Okay. So the first thing I would just like to do is to start from the pulse. So I look at the pulse of the patient and then check the pulse and pay attention. You can count for like 15 seconds and check for the rate. Okay. So this. After that, you multiply by four, whatever you get, um, to give you the estimated rate. But however, pay attention to the you know, rhythm as well, whether it's regular or whether it's not. If they have an irregular pulse, it may suggest uh, atrial fibrillation, or it could suggest ventricular ectopics, especially if it's irregularly irregular. Then other than that, it might also be regularly irregular, where it might suggest atrial flutter with a fixed block for example. Um, so it's important to know whether the heart rate is regular or not. And if the pulse rate is not regular, then you might also need to check the heart rate later. So at the heart rate, you can get the pulse rate and subtract it from the heart rate. If the value is more than 10, some people will say more than 12 or even 15. So if the value is more than 10, bit per minute, the difference between the heart rate and the pulse rate is more than 10, the pulse deficit more than 10 will suggest an atrial fibrillation. But if it's less than 10, it might suggest some ventricular ectopics. So after the rate, and you also check for the regularity, or the rhythmicity, then you want to pay attention to the volume. Is it like a small volume pulse, which might be seen in conditions like aortic stenosis? Or is it a large volume pulse, which can be seen in conditions like aortic regurgitation, or high volume states, like beriberi, anemia, uh, intravenous malformation? Then, after paying attention to the volume, you want to check for the synchronicity with the contractor radial pulse. So it's important not to back the patient. You do not do this, but you'll be backing the patient. So what you need to do is to switch your hand using your left ear, then you feel the pulse on the other side as well. So if there is absence of the radial pulse on one side, it might suggest some vasculitis like Takayasu arthritis, or we have like a brachial artery stenosis or radial artery stenosis or even at times if you have like an aortic dissection the volume might be different um so you also want to check for your radio femoral delay so you ask the patient to pull down a bit then you check you know for the pulses all right so and see if there's any evidence of radio femoral delay which might suggest a coarctation of the aorta then a thickened arterial wall can also be checked for, especially in this part of the world where you want to see any evidence of long-standing hypertension. So what you do is that you put your three fingers on the radial pulse. After getting the pulse, the next thing is to occlude distally with your ring finger. So occlude distally, then you empty the pulse. You empty the, 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 the artery. So try to empty and occlude proximally again, then you feel against the bone. So you're trying to feel the empty vessel and see whether it, the wall is thick or it's not as well. Then finally, especially if the pulse is large volume, you think you know, it looks like a bounding large volume pulse, then you want to check whether the pulse is collapsing or not. So how do you do that? The first thing to ask the patient, do you have any pain in your shoulder? No. no? Then the next thing, you roll your hand you know, on the under surface of the wrist and try to make sure it's still on the radial pulse. Okay, while you still feel the large volume. And then you can put the other hand just close on the brachial artery. Okay. 
the big artery is just medial to the tendon of biceps. Then you tell the patient, I'm going to lift your hand up, you know, that's fine. Right. Then, so you try to lift the hand up suddenly. And when you do this, you see that the volume that you feel in the radial pulse, you know, it's going to collapse. So it becomes suddenly absent. And that's due to diastolic runoff because of the regurgitation. So the volume you know, completely collapses and disappears. And by the time you bring it down, you know, you can feel the pulse, you know, bounding as well again. So that's how to check for the collapsing pulse. You might see that in aortic regurgitation or conditions like beriberi or even thyroid toxicosis. So after that, the next thing to do to check for the locomotor brachialis. So you want to check for that. So you want to shine your pen touch and see if there's any evidence of a visible tortuous pulsatile brachial artery, which I can't appreciate here. Okay, so it's not obvious here. Yeah? You may also want to check on the other side, you know, which is not, you know, obvious as well. So bend you know, the elbow a bit and you check for that. Then you tell the examiner at this point that you like to check the blood pressure. So in the context of the exam, they might just tell you to skip that and move on. But this must be mentioned to the examiner. And then the next thing to do is to go to the neck. So it's important to know the pattern from the pulse to the elbows, to the arms, for the, uh, then the neck. So what are you checking here? You're trying to check for the raised jugular venous um, pulsation. So the JVP is what you're checking for around here. And then um, you want to see whether it's raised or not. So the first thing to look at is that, can you see any you know, visible pulsation? So the visible pulsation can be two things. It can be the carotids, which is usually monophasic. So you just see one pulsation. But it can be biphasic, which might be the vein. So that's the jugular vein. So the jugular vein venous pulsation, you see it can be biphasic or multiphasic. So you see it coming, like, coming up twice. But if it's a monophasic carotid, usually close somewhere here, around the angle of the jaw, you see it's as monophasic. For you to check the jugular venous pulsation, so you ask the patient to turn the neck to the other side, then you shine the light, you know, at an hour, uh, uh, trying the light to look at the the veins or maybe the pulsation uh, in the neck. So obviously there are no visible pulsations here, but there are, there are two possibilities. It could be a carotid pulsation or a venous pulsation. So if it's a carotid pulsation, it will be palpable. It will be it will be very palpable because it's an artery. But if it's a venous pulsation, because it's a vein, it will collapse. So it will be palpable. So that's one of the differences. Then for carotid pulsation. Um, while you shine light almost at the right angle to the neck, you find that for carotid pulsation, it's usually monophasic, just once, it goes up once. For jugular venous pulsation, it can be multiphasic or biphasic twice. Then another thing you can do is to do a hepatojugular reflux. You ask the patient, do you have any pain in your tummy, sir? No. Okay, so can you turn your head to that side? Okay, so you press the abdomen gently, and while doing that, you see check for whether the veins become um, filled up. And it could go as high as the angle, just behind the ears or in, you know, around the tragos here. So it's very important to know, to look at for the evidence of the vein, yeah, between the two heads of sternocleidomastoid. So to see if there's any raised jugular venous position. So internal jugular vein is usually the best, but difficult to appreciate. So at times people might want to use the external jugular vein as well. So obviously I can't see any distended neck veins at this point. So I'm going to press your tummy gently. All right, that's fine. They can press for about five, 10 seconds and see whether the veins will come up. Okay, so it's not really obvious. So that's good. Other, mod other things you can do to differentiate between a carotid pulsation or jugular venous pulsation is to ask to take a deep breath in and out. So the person takes a deep breath in and out for a jugular venous pulsation, you find that it kind of disappears because there's increased venous return back to the heart on inspiration. So the pulsation goes down. It doesn't change in carotid pulsation. Then also changing position, you can ask him to sit up. So the obvious, the jugular venous pulsation on sitting up, it, it, it empties because of um, postural change. So it disappears relative to a carotid pulsation, which remains persistence even despite position change so that's uh, the next thing is to 
inspect the precordium. So the precordium is the area of the chest wall, overlying the anterior chest wall overlying the heart. So you want to pay attention to, for any scars, a midline sternotomy scar. So if you have a midline sternotomy scar, there might also be two drain scars just beneath it. So that might suggest maybe a heart transplant, or it could be you know, a case of valve replacement, or it could be a case of a pericardial surgery, or even at times a thymectomy, but that would be very small in the midline. Then at the same time, you can also have a scar here, yeah? then the left infraclavicular fossa, which might suggest um, perhaps be a pacemaker placement or could suggest a cardiac resynchronization therapy uh, device. So it's important to pay attention to these areas. There are times if there's mitral valve repair, you could also see some scars around there, or even at times on the right. Um, so the next thing is to look over the precordium, and while doing that, you're trying to see you know, the area of maximal cardiac impulse. Area of maximal cardiac impulse. So I'm trying to look for that. You may even want to shine the pen torch to appreciate that. Okay. So you, um, so you, at the same time, you're also trying to see whether the precordium is hyperactive or just normal active. Hyperactive in the sense that you see evidence of the, you know, the chest wall moving up on, you know, due to the increased activity of the left ventricle. So it seems normal here. Yeah, I can't really see any activity. So the precordium looks normal active. So the next thing is to locate the apex bit which is the outermost lateralmost area of maximal cardiac impulse. So I try to put my three, four fingers there, just beneath the nipple. If it's a female, you might need to ask the patient to reflect the breast. Or, you know, if the patient, you seek the consent of patients, might just reflect the breast, then, you know, check for it on in the intercostal spaces, just beneath the breast. Um, so it's, if it's difficult to find, you may want to turn the patient to the left side, and that brings the heart very close to the fingers. Okay. All right. So I can feel it now. So somewhere here. All right. So you leave a finger there. So that's the area that's actually, you know, the that's the area of the apex bits pushing my finger the most. Um. So you now count from the second intercostal space. So the second intercostal space is from the ridge. You, know, you treat the ridge down. From the standard upper standard border, bring it to the ridge. This is the mandibular standard ridge. Then the space there is second intercostal space. So second intercostal space. Then go to the next space, which is third. Bring this finger here. Then the fourth into the space. Right. Then the fifth. So this is the fifth intercostal space. For patients with pendulous breast, it might be difficult to do that. So you might want to just count, you know, uh, down like this. Second you know third fourth fifth then you trace it down so that so don't count over the breast that would be wrong so make sure you get to your area of maximum cardiac impulse then you want to check for eaves are there any eaves you no know, so you may want to use this space for eaves for trills you want to check for trills and you want to check for palpable a2 or palpable p2 use a finger pop so I'll see whether this place the check for left ventricular eave i can't appreciate anything then check for eaves here in the right ventricular, for right ventricular eave, or what we felt as the left parastana eave. I can't appreciate anything. Don't press too hard on the chest of the patient. So we check for eaves there. Then you can check for trills in the four valvular areas. So the mitral area, you check for trills, like a palpable mama. So see, uh, see if you have you know, something flowing underneath your fingers. Um, so you use this place to check for trill. So I can't feel anything. A trill is a palpable mama. And the presence of a trill will suggest at least a great form of Then check for trills here as well. Then check for trills in the second intercostal space for aortic. So one of the ways to remember that is in the spelling AOR, the hard starts on the right. Then pull monary, P U L, pulmonary is on the left. They held there as the third letter. So the aortic intercostal space, you can check it like this. Make sure this place is on the second intercostal space somewhere. Here. Some people will also do it like this. So whichever is comfortable for you. Then the pulmonary intercostal space, put, make sure you have the parts of your hand there. Like you may want to do it like this. So you check for trills in all the four valvular areas, the mitral, the tricuspid, the aortic, and the pulmonary. Then finally check for a palpable A2 or a palpable P2. So you put your fingers there in the second intercostal space to feel something that looks like a pulse. 
no pushing your hand so is there any palpable here too i can't feel anything here then the pumping between the intercostal space all right so that's not there as well then you now want to listen with your um, stethoscope so you want to listen in the four valvular areas with your diaphragm diaphragm then you now listen to your bell as well so bells the bell of the stethoscope is usually used to pick low pitch sounds um, and diaphragm used to pick high pitch sounds um, so make sure your stethoscope is directed forward so while inserting to your ears then you confirm for, put it over the area that you felt the apex bit check for any additional art sound aside the s1 s2 a third art sound may actually suggest rapid ventricular feeling that you might see in heart failure or mitral regurgitation and a fourth art sound suggests an atrial systole against a non-compliant ventricle which might suggest a left uh, ventricular hypertrophy or hypertensive heart disease or case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well or aortic stenosis then you also listen over the left prostate area still with the diaphragm check for any murmurs as well any additional sounds which probably you might not have appreciated in the mitral area then the pulmonary area also for any murmurs then the aortic area for any murmurs so it might be wise to just make sure that you put your thumb on the carotids while doing this this is also able to time your murmurs as well so any murmurs that come after the first heart sound or that's after a carotid pulsation is most likely a systolic murmur so any murmur that comes after the s2 right or just before the carotid pulsation will be a diastolic murmur so one way to remember that is SSS. S1, if you have any moment there, that would be a systolic moment, then your S2. So, but any moment that comes after a second heart sound most likely be a diastolic moment. So after checking with your diaphragm in all the four valvular areas, the next thing is to turn your stethoscope and turn into the bell. You want to check all the four valvular areas again. All right, so check all the four valvular areas. Now, if you pick any moments, you might want to check, do some maneuvers, preferably maybe to your diaphragm. So you want to check for so your carotid patient, if it's in the mitral area, you can turn the carotid patient to turn to the left, all right, and you try to, the carotid patient to hold the breath on expiration. So take a deep breath in, then out. Hold your breath there. So the murmurs, left side murmurs are accentuated or increased on expiration. Then you want to trace it to the axilla to confirm, because it's radius to the axilla. For tricuspid murmurs, you can ask the patient to hold his breath in, take a deep breath in. So the murmurs of right-sided valves, like tricuspid, will be accentuated on inspiration. Then the same thing for, that's fine. Then for the aortic, the murmur of the aortic stenosis, for example, all right, there might be a fourth heart sound, there might be a systolic murmur, but the murmur radiates to the neck, to the carotids. So you want to trace this murmur to the axilla. So you might want to confirm that by placing your, you know, your stirrup and ask you to hold the breath and take a deep breath in and out, then hold it, please. So if you feel the murmur radiating, the systolic murmur radiating here, it might suggest aortic stenosis. But if you pick the systolic murmur here between one and two, but does not radiate, it might suggest aortic sclerosis. Then for aortic regurgitation, if you are the best in the left parastana area, then you ask the patient to sit up. So you sit up for me. Then ask him to lean forward, then hold the breast in expiration. Can you do that for me? Then hold the breast. So it will be a diastolic murmur. So it's here after the second heart sound. So it sounds very loud you know, you know, after the second heart sound. So that's in the murmur of aortic regurgitation. So these are the maneuvers you can do you know, to appreciate your moments. And always remember to compare your P2 component to your A2 component when listening to all the four five layers. A loud P2 will suggest a pulmonary hypertension, while a loud A2 will suggest a systemic hypertension. Then you might also want to listen to your carotids again. Just check for carotid breathe. 
So just below the angle of the jaw, yeah. All right. So check your characters. Medial to the uh, head of standard cord mouth. So yeah. Um, so hold the breath for me and check for any carotid brie. Okay, that's fine. Then check the other side as well. Hold the breath, please. And that's fine. Then finally, you ask him to sit up to check for any evidence of pulmonary edema by, you know, ask him to take a deep breath in and out and listen to the lung bases. Uh, check for any fine crackles especially in spiritual carpools at the base of the lungs. Okay, that's fine, sir. Then ask him to sit back up, to sit back. Then it's possible if you have time, you may also check for quick tender hepatomegaly, but make sure you look at the patient's face to see if there's any enlarged liver, all right? So if you see any tender soft hepatomegaly, you might also confirm your um, evidence of congestion. Then finally, Look at the feet of the bed, check for your pedal edema. You can also suggest features of right ventricular failure, just like the hepatomegaly and then um, the raised JVP. So you press over the medial malleolus, looking at the patient's face, and you press for like five for about 10 seconds, then you rub your fingers, rub your fingers over it and see if there's any pity. So if there's none, then you thank your patient, you clean your hands, then you tell the patient to put on his clothes back. Thank you so much, sir. That's the end of the examination.